The imagination of a depression-weary public was captivated in 1938 by a brash, errant aviator named Douglas Corrigan. He had made repeated requests to attempt a transatlantic solo flight, but American aviation authorities turned down his requests. His 1929 Curtis Robin monoplane was deemed unworthy of more than an experimental aircraft certification. His rickety plane was so precariously patched together that it was dubbed as an airborne crate and a flying jalopy. He bought the plane in New York for $310 in 1933 and nursed it cow pasture by cow pasture back to California, giving rides along the way to make money. What were the chances of his making the flight in that flimsy aircraft? It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, founded by George Vanderman, sharing messages of hope around the world. Today, Henry Fire Robin presents Filled with the Spirit. A few people at Floyd Bennett Field in New York were baffled when Mr. Corrigan took off at 5.15 in the morning of July 17, 1938, and disappeared into a cloud bank to the east. According to his flight plan, he should have been heading west. <laughs> the next day, he landed his improbable plane in Dublin, Ireland. I'm Douglas Corrigan, he told a group of startled airport workers when he landed. Just got in from New York. Where am I? I intended to fly to California. With a more or less straight face, he claimed to have been led astray by a faulty compass. When he returned to New York, an estimated one million New Yorkers lined Lower Broadway for a ticker tape parade that some thought actually eclipsed the one given for Charles Lindbergh after his solo flight to Paris in 1927. Mr. Corrigan's 3,150-mile flight was an immediate sensation pushing depressing economic news and international reports aside on the front pages of America's newspapers and dominating radio broadcasts across the country. He became known as Wrong Way Corrigan, and with months, within months he was endorsing Wrong Way products, including a watch that ran backwards. A longing for sensationalism made Wrong Way Corrigan famous during the Depression. The public has never lost its flair for the sensational. Even in religion, many people prefer the sensational to solid truth. A religious leader recently said that if he heard of a clergyman down the street preaching the gospel, he would just turn on his TV and go on watching his favorite program. However, if he were told that someone down the street was performing miracles, he would drop everything to see what was happening. We're fascinated by the spectacular and the sensational. Many people today would be more impressed by the feat of a wrong way Corrigan than the solid results of a Charles Lindbergh. It has been said that the 20th century could be called the century of the Holy Spirit. There's been a shift from faith to feelings, from reason to the esoteric revelation, from fact to fantasy. To many people, to be filled with the Spirit signifies a highly emotional state in which there's a great deal of confusion and even bizarre behavior. J. Gresham McCann said, What the Holy Spirit does is not to make a man a Christian regardless of the evidence, but on the contrary, to clear away the mist from his eyes and enable him to attend to the evidence. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Holy Scriptures. Through the Bible, we are given a solemn warning. We find it in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. What are the tests by which we determine which spiritual manifestations are genuine and which are false? The Bible gives a number of tests. One of them is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19. 
And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This is one of the important tests, to the law and to the testimony. The Holy Spirit will never contradict Himself. All spiritual manifestations must be tested by the Scriptures. If they are not in accordance with the Bible, there's no light in them. Our Lord gives us another test. We find it in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 and 16. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. We have to learn to be fruit inspectors. The Bible tells us clearly what the fruits of the Spirit are. And Jesus says that any tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit should be cut down, verse 19. Any fruits that are unfamiliar to the Bible landscape are not from the Holy Spirit. The manifestations of the Holy Spirit are always given for a purpose. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us about the gifts and then tells us what their purpose is. We turn to Ephesians. Ephesians 4, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Any manifestation that doesn't carry out this purpose should be carefully examined. Just imagine your city receiving a visit of the Queen of England. She's scheduled to give a lecture in the most elite hall in town. The moment arrives for her grand entry. She walks out onto the platform as the spotlight follows her every step. The spotlight operator does such a superb job of following her entry that the crowd forgets about the queen and turns around to give the spotlight operator a standing ovation. The Holy Spirit always casts the spotlight on Jesus, never on himself. In the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 14, we read, and he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. In some circles, the Holy Spirit is placed on such a high profile that Christ remains in the shadows. Generally, people who are filled with the Holy Spirit don't go out and brag about it or call attention to themselves. The Holy Spirit didn't come to make us Holy Spirit conscious, but Christ conscious. The filling of the Spirit is not a matter of feeling, but of faith. On January 20, 1994, a reporter walked into a Christian church in Canada, and here's what he saw. 80% of the people were on the floor. Some shook and jerked, some danced, some laughed, some barked like dogs, and others oinked like pigs. The sound man got drunk, and the church receptionist couldn't talk for three days. That same year, a church leader's wife would get so drunk with the Holy Spirit that her husband had to carry her upstairs. When this happened, he would have to undress her. She was so intoxicated. In some churches, they now have what they call Holy Spirit bartenders who dispense portions of the Holy Spirit upon the parishioners until they're totally inebriated. They have to have designated drivers as the people who receive the Holy Spirit are too intoxicated to safely drive home. One woman was driving so erratically that she was stopped by a police officer. The woman apparently was so drunk that she had difficulty just rolling down her window. When the officer tried to remove her from the car, he touched her and became so drunk himself that she had to lead him back to his patrol car. Another story involves a lady in similar circumstances asked to undertake a breathalyzer test. As she blew into the bag, the policeman fell to the ground laughing. Besides getting drunk in the Spirit, people are subjected to the glue of the Spirit. A book called Holy Ghost Glue tells of a lady who was glued to the floor of the church from noon until 6 p.m. She tried to get up, but all she could do was flap her hands. She lay there flapping away and saying, I can't get up, I'm stuck to the floor. I've heard people say that the precedent for this kind of action was set on the day of Pentecost. The disciples must have behaved like intoxicated individuals because the people of Jerusalem thought they were drunk. The second chapter of Acts tells the story in detail. 
The disciples received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 2, 4. The people were amazed. There were people from many different nations. Their question was, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Acts 2, 8. The Bible says they were all amazed. But then the doubters made their appearance. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Acts 2, 13. Do these words of the mockers indicate that the disciples were acting like drunken people? Remember, the critics of Jesus also accused him of unseemly behavior. We read in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 11, verse 15. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Now, it's unlikely that any serious student of the Scriptures would use this statement as an indication that Jesus behaved in demonic fashion. Those who mocked Jesus also mocked His disciples, and they were capable of spreading any type of false rumors. They were afraid that the miracle of the gift of tongues would weaken their priestly hold on the people. And some of the more ignorant might have seized on this suggestion as truth, but the more intelligent knew it to be false, especially those who understood the words of the apostles in their own language. There's no indication of any inappropriate behavior on the part of the disciples. To the contrary, they were anything but confused. Peter is completely changed since his denial of Christ. The Holy Spirit has endued him with insight and power. He stands before the people as a sanctified leader. Instead of staggering in uncertainty, he steps out with strong conviction and boldness. Instead of slurred words, there is detailed, well-reasoned discourse. The prophecies concerning Christ are unfolded with method and clarity. His comportment was the opposite of that of a drunken man. To imply that to be filled with the Holy Spirit would produce the same results as to be filled with wine is to ignore completely the truth about the Holy Spirit. The effects of alcohol and the effects of the Holy Spirit are in no way the same. That is why the Apostle Paul presents them as a total contrast. We read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 18. Paul says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The word translated excess is translated from the Greek word akostia, which means debauchery, rioting, revelry, and refers to excess of every kind. These are the natural results of getting drunk with wine. They are not the results of being filled with the Spirit. There's a deep and wide gap that marks the difference between getting drunk and being filled with the Spirit. Drunkenness always leads a person downward to the depths of the brute and even lower. Fullness of the Spirit leads upward to the very heights of God. Why do people get drunk? Well, often they're looking for exhilaration. On special occasions like weddings, birthdays, and even religious holidays, they feel that it's appropriate to indulge in alcoholic beverages. They're filled with glee, merriment, and tumultuous laughter. Their personality changes completely. The common person suddenly feels that he's very important. <laughs> the person who hardly knows the letters of the alphabet thinks he's a philosopher. The poor, miserable rogue who doesn't have two shirts to his name is transformed into a millionaire. The effects of the Holy Spirit never deceive. The drunkard becomes stupefied while the person filled with the Spirit is filled with wisdom. Alcohol causes unruliness, while the Spirit brings perfect order. Alcohol causes unsteadiness. The Spirit produces firmness and steadiness. Alcohol produces irreverence, while the Spirit brings reverence. When the Spirit fills the soul, there's joy, delight, and the elevation of the mind, delightful and healthful excitement, which lifts the person above the dull, dead level of ordinary life and causes him to rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. It's a safe delight, never a stupor. It makes a person delight in the things that are pleasing to God. Those who drink are deceived into thinking that they are made strong. The weakling feels that he can start a fight with someone twice his size. 
By contrast, there's real strength in the power of the Holy Spirit. There is spiritual strength. There is strength of faith. There is strength to bear life's burdens, strength to conquer temptation, strength to live a holy life. There's a mystic power given by the Holy Spirit. Alcohol produces boldness. A person under the influence will do what he would never think of doing if he were sober. Soldiers who have been afraid to go into battle have been dosed with alcohol to give them courage. Then they have risked their lives and performed what seemed to be feats of valor, when if they had been in their right mind, they would have considered these things to be foolhardily. Being filled with the Holy Spirit never makes people ridiculous or fanatical. The boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit is a quiet boldness, which is to be admired, never derided. It is something that a person never regrets afterward. When filled with the Spirit, humble people speak out for God. Slaves and peasants have faced Roman governments without fear. They've faced lions and flames without flinching. The Holy Spirit is the creator of true heroes. Without Him, we'd all be cowards. Wine has been taken to kill pain and drown out misery. It's a known sedative. The Holy Spirit removes depression in a completely different manner. If you want to forget your misery, apply for the sweet visitation from the Comforter. His consolation can balance our tribulations. God wants you to drink the deep draughts of the joy of the Lord until you're filled with the Spirit of God. There are many social drinkers. They drink to friends. They drink to their health with alcohol, which is poisonous. Often the effects of this type of friendship lead only to disappointment. The opposite is true of Christian fellowship, which leads to holy conversation, solemn worship, joy in sharing the manifold blessings of God. In the context of this verse, Paul says, speaking to yourselves with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. Unfortunately, much of the new gospel music has more rhythm than melody. People seem to think that to put trite religious words to profane music baptizes the music and makes it sacred. The Great Reformation spawned majestic songs of praise like a mighty fortress is our God. These have been replaced by superficial, shallow, shameful verses. One of the choruses sung in a modern church claims to depict the voice of the Holy Spirit using these words, I'm a steamroller, baby, and I'm going to roll over you. Here are some of the words of another song sung in a large church. The words go like this. I just laugh like an idiot and bark like a dog. If I don't sober up, I'll hop like a frog. I'll crow like a rooster at the break of day because the Holy Ghost is moving and I can't stay away. I'll roar like a lioness who's on the prowl. I'll laugh and shake and maybe hoot like an owl. Wine doesn't really fill. The more a person drinks, the thirstier he becomes because wine dehydrates the body. Alcohol increases thirst. The Holy Spirit has a satisfying influence which is never nauseating. It fills to the brim, to the place where the saint cries out, My cup runneth over. Alcohol ministers to the lust, which is a burning sensation of what we want. Wine creates riots. It deadens the sense of hearing, and people speak louder and louder. They're prone to create a disturbance. The Holy Spirit makes a Christian quiet with a deep, unutterable peace. You may sing and rejoice, but there's a deep calm in your soul. Alcohol causes contention. Drunken people are always ready to quarrel or fight. They're easily insulted, ready to fight everybody and anybody. The Spirit of God works submissiveness. Instead of wanting to be first, the Spirit-possessed person will be satisfied to be last if he can thus glorify God. Drunkenness makes people foolish. The Spirit of God makes them wise. In the same context, Paul says, See that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, Ephesians 5.15. A drunken person can't walk circumspectly. Often he can't walk at all. 
He tries to go into two directions at the same time and ends up staggering until he falls. The person filled with the Spirit has a very definite idea of which way he is going. He can walk the straight and narrow way with firm, unfaltering steps. What does it really mean to be filled with the Holy Ghost? To be filled means to be totally controlled. The effects of the drink dominate a person who is full of whiskey. A child who is full of mischief is constantly causing trouble because he is controlled by the mischief. The Bible says that Judas was full of the devil when he betrayed Christ. The devil controlled him. People who are filled with fear are dominated by fear. The Bible cites a number of people who were filled with the Holy Ghost. There is a common result that is dominant in each instance. The evidence of being filled is seen in power for ministry or service to God. And that power is never turned inward, but always used in service. The disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.4, and conducted one of the greatest evangelistic meetings in history with 3,000 baptized in one day. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, preached a mighty Christ-centered sermon, Acts 4.8. Later in the same chapter, the Bible says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word with boldness. Barnabas was filled with the Holy Ghost, and much people was added to the Lord, Acts 11.24. The way to tell if a person is under the influence of the Holy Spirit is to see the fruit. Fruits indicate what kind of tree they are growing on. Watch the conduct of a Christian. Compare it with the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and you will soon tell if that person is being controlled by the Holy Ghost. Attending a revival in a southern town in America was a man noted for his periodic conversions and backslidings. Moved with emotion, he prayed with fervor, that he might receive an abundant portion of the Holy Spirit. Also at the revival was an elderly lady who knew the man very well, and she cried out, Don't give it to him, Lord. He leaks. Oh, may we not be leaky vessels. We all need to be filled with the Holy Spirit who will give us power not to act like inebriated people, but reveal the power of service and the fruits of the Spirit. Oh, that God may bless each one of us. If my people, which I call by my name, shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray.
Let us pray. Our Father and our God, fill us with the Holy Spirit so that our lives may reflect your holy character and your great love. As we allow the Spirit to control our lives, the fruit will be evident and people will know that we are true Christians by our daily conduct. Bless each viewer now. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Being filled with the Spirit is not optional. The Bible commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5.18. How can a person be filled with the Spirit, seeing that it is not a liquid or an impersonal force? We are told that Satan entered into Judas when he tempted Christ. The fact that Judas was full of the devil implies that he was under Satan's control. We can choose to be dominated by the Spirit. When this happens, our lives will reveal the fruit of the Spirit. Today's message is one of ten that are included in Henry Fire Robin's new book, The Royal Ambassador. Your copy is waiting for you without cost or obligation. Here's the information you need to receive the book. As a convenience, you may request today's free gift offer by calling our toll-free number at 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, 1-800-253-3000. Remember your gift is sent free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the gift you're requesting. Call toll-free from anywhere in North America, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open 24 hours daily. Or, if you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to It Is Written. Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H 7V4. And now again the time has come to say goodbye for another week. We look forward to seeing you again next week at this same time. Until then, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Thank you.